Let's talk about setting up a VPN today because VPNs are essential. Uh, when you're working from home, you need to get into your business network and work as if you're in the office. VPNs are really, that's what they're made for. I mean, it's amazing. So I'm gonna explain four different ways of doing a VPN and just jump right into this. So depending on what hardware you have, uh, this will be easier uh, or harder depending on what you have. But either way, one of these ways will work for you depending on your current environment. So uh, I'll go ahead and jump into the very first way, which is probably the most universal way. And I actually made an entire video over this specific way. So if you take this route, uh, look in the description for that link. And I'll also put it in the title, title card up here. But that is just to make a open VPN server. Now I love open VPN. It's definitely the most uh, probably secure out of the top three when you got PPTP and you got L2TP. Um, those both are really, really bad uh, protocols. They're kind of ancient and very hackable. Obviously, L2TP is more prominent and a little more secure, but still not great. I, I really hate those VPNs. So OpenVPN is my go-to VPN when I set up VPNs. Um, but obviously, you can recycle some old hardware if you have a uh, host somewhere, you can go ahead and just toss it on a box. Uh, you could even use an old NAS box and, and just load Linux on it and then just host a VPN from it. Uh, that whole video kind of explains how to set up all of that in a Linux environment. So if you're a Linux admin or you know Linux server and you're not afraid of that, by all means do that. That's really what that whole video is. But this video is more meant for those that don't know much about Linux, uh, at least in the short term. We're still definitely interfacing with Linux in this video, but we're doing it from the GUI. So this is definitely more noob friendly. So with that, uh, I will be going over two boxes, two network attached storage boxes in this video. I have a Synology box here, a 1019, which I absolutely love. And then also I have a QNAP in my day job. So I'm gonna kind of show you a VPN setup on these. Now, normally you would just serve files from them, but they can be dual purpose as VPNs only require just a very, very small amount of compute power for the most part, unless you're computing, you know, connecting hundreds and hundreds of people, obviously, you probably want a more dedicated box. But if you have a QNAP or Synology box, honestly, you're probably in a small business or somewhere where you have 50 or less employees and you're really not doing too much with it. So with that, let's jump on the desktop and go over these two boxes. So we'll start with the Synology box. Uh, Synology, very easy. Just go into Package Manager. From Package Manager, all you're doing is just going into the VPN package. It's the official, you don't need a community repository or anything like that. You can just come right down to VPN. And honestly, I, I should probably just go VPN and search. And then just make sure you click Install and Open. And that's it. So once that's done, it opens the VPN server. I went ahead and made a little icon on my desktop, but you don't have to. Uh, let's start with the very beginning. We'll go ahead and say yes to leave. This is what we have. Obviously, I just said, if you have an option to do OpenVPN, do OpenVPN. The reasons are many. You have better encryption. It's easier to set up. It works better. Just use OpenVPN. If you, you have to debate me whether OpenVPN is better or not, you don't deserve to be in IT. <laughs> So uh, with that said, we only have OpenVPN enabled as it should be. Uh, connection list, log, pretty expl explanatory. If someone's connected, it would actually show here and you could actually disconnect their session uh, if you wanted. Uh, general settings, this is pretty much filled in by default, so you don't really have to do anything here. I'm using a bonded network, so if, uh, let's say, one of my network connections actually goes out in there or a NIC card goes out in my Synology box, I would still have all my connections. And then privilege, this is where you'd set up all your users. So uh, this is actually the users on the box. It auto-populates them. Uh, just know that you can set up LDAP. So if you have an active directory in your business, by all means, use LDAP, it's much easier. Uh, but if all you have is this box, just add a user and then just make them a baseline level user. I made mine Titus. And then I only give them OpenVPN. I always disable admin and guest as these should never be left enabled on any network attached storage. And obviously everything else is unchecked as those users don't need to be on the VPN. So with that said, we can move on to the open VPN setup. 
Now I want to explain what each one of these fields are so you can fill it in properly. Um, so the dynamic IP address, this is basically what IP it's going to give the actual tunnel. So when you connect to a VPN, you have your local address that's here. You have your remote address, which is, let's say, the business you're connecting to or, uh, or the business where this VPN resides. And then you have the tunnel address, which is completely a whole different uh, sub subnet. So a good uh, thing to remember here is none of them can overlap. So it, here at the house, I have a 192.168.69 subnet. At the business, I have, I believe it's a 192.168.10.0 like address. And then I, I'm just making the open VPN server 10.8.0.1. Um, but this could be 10.69.69.0 if you wanted. It doesn't matter. Uh, just make sure the addresses do not match for the actual dynamic, dynamic IP. And then for the maximum connection numbers, since it's a, a little small box like this, obviously don't probably go above 10. 30 is the absolute maximum that you, you're going to be using here. Um, but I'm going to just leave it on five. Maximum number per same account, three. Uh, honestly, I usually leave it at three just because if someone disconnects and connects right away, it'll actually do a concurrent connection and finally drop off that old one. So having at least two in this field is recommended. And the port, by default, OpenVPN always uses 1194 on UDP. I always leave it on UDP. I never change it. Occasionally, um, you can have a little bit of security by obscurity. Uh, I'm not a big fan of this, so I usually leave things default, but some people are, and if that's you, by all means, change the port number. As far as the encryption, I leave it at 256 CBC, and that's AES, and then authentication, SHA-512. Uh, SHA-512 is a little bit overboard probably on encryption, um, but it, just know that's very, very secure at those numbers. You can do SHA-1, you could change that around too. There's nothing wrong with the lowering uh, authentication, but um, for this video, I'm gonna leave it at this. Uh, enable compression over VPN link. I usually always leave that enabled. Why put more traffic on it than you have to? Allow clients to access the server's LAN. So if you don't enable this, the only thing they're gonna have access to when they establish the VPN in is this network attached storage, nothing else. But you don't want that, obviously, if you're setting it up for this purpose to access, like let's say another resource on this network, you'd wanna enable this. And with that, you would just simply hit apply. Now, this isn't done though. So this is the server setup and it's literally, that's all it is. Very, very simplistic. We just export this configuration and it just exports out to this OpenVPN zip file. So this OpenVPN zip file is just right there. Very, very simplistic. That server is completely done and set up. Let's go over to QNAP. So for their service, it's almost identical. It's, it's kind of hilarious. They just added a Q in front of it. So it's Q VPN service. And there's uh, obviously they have all of the same uh, things here. Obviously I'll blur out all these users and IPs, but you can see all the people that are connected and how long they've been connected for and what VPN client ID they're using. Um, right now we have seven connections through the open VPN and then these are down. And then privilege settings. This is where I actually am using uh, the domain users. This is all done from ad users. And this is an Active Directory joined uh, QNAP where I just go ahead and pull in those users and it shows if they're connected or not or if they're just ready to be connected. But as far as the configuration, this is really where all the magic happens is under OpenVPN. All you need to do, is same as Synology, enable it, Identify the actual client IP pool, the server port, I leave it at 1194 UDP. Maximum number of clients is 15, as most people shouldn't be using this one. This is just kind of a fail back for some Mac users and some other stuff. And then obviously use this connection as default gateway for remote devices and compress the VPN link. Same thing, um, the only thing this one doesn't have where the Synology box did have is allow client access to the LAN. That was just kind of locking down that VPN. So uh, that that is not here on the QNAP, but very similar, honestly. I usually check that anyways. And then uh, just download the certificate. So with that, I'll click download. You'll see it downloaded as this file and we're done. 
So I'll go ahead and exit out of this. To start out here, we're gonna go to openvpn.net community downloads. This is the free and open source version of OpenVPN. Just come right down into here, there'll be an actual download page. Depending on what you're using, you just simply select it. I'm using Windows 10 here. We'll go ahead and select this. And I've kind of blown up my desktop so you can easily see all the downloads. So we see OpenVPN right here. Coming over into downloads, we simply just open this file and install it. All right, once the installation's complete, you'll see a new icon on your desktop called OpenVPN GUI. We're gonna go ahead and double click that to open it. You'll see it here. If you don't see it in your task tray, click here. You should see it actually move to here. To move it to always show in your task tray, just adjust your taskbar settings to always show that icon. You'll say select which icons appear on the taskbar. Scroll down to open VPN GUI for Windows and tick it on. And then you'll notice it is always in our task tray. From here, we just can easily import a inline file that we have, uh, which we can do, but I'm just gonna go to edit config. Now, obviously this is just the sample file that comes with OpenVPN, and we're gonna just go ahead and wipe this out. So let's go to this directory. And I already have a whole bunch of files in here, but I'm gonna go ahead and delete all these files, as I don't even remember what they were for. And if you had a zip file with a whole bunch of CA certs and everything, you'd drop them into here. Now, obviously with the QNAP on our desktop, we have the entire just inline open VPN file. Inline file basically means all the certificates are bundled into the OVPN file and you don't need to do any of this. However, if you do have the zip file, like Synology's case, you'd extract all of the zip file directly into the config directory. So instead of importing it using the inline, which is pretty darn easy, I'm gonna actually just pretend like that OVPN file had a whole bunch of CA certificates and we're gonna just copy it over into the config directory. All right, with that now in there, all we have is QNAP, OVPN, and we're gonna try and establish a connection. We'll just right click and connect, and then just type our password. Once the icon turns green, that means you're connected and we have an assigned IP. Uh, please note, uh, for Linux-based tutorials, check out the video in the description and uh, click that one. That actually walks you through how to do it both in Terminal and also in a KDE Network Manager. So with the server set up, we're not quite out of the woods yet. Um, I'm going to my PFSense box. And since I have the Synology box here, I would show you how to port forward. Now, I'm not gonna go into port forwarding just because everyone's port forward experience is different because every router is a little different. Just look up your router model and how to port forward. There's only one port you need to port forward, and that is 1194 UDP, unless you change that port in when setting up the server. Pretty darn simple. I absolutely love this method uh, because, well, it's only one port. Uh, when you do L2TP uh, and you also have PPTP, those you need protocols, you need to open up ports. It can be a little more cumbersome, not to mention less secure. So that's why I love OpenVPN because of the simplicity of it and also the security of it. So with that, I would go into the actual firewall, uh, go into NAT and then do a proper port forward. I would go ahead and add uh, the port 1194 UDP and push it to the static IP of my Synology box. Obviously, I'm not gonna do that because it's time for the last option for you. Uh, and let's say you have a PFSense box. Guess what? It has OpenVPN capabilities built right into it. Uh, so if you're ever gonna set up a PFSense box for this, you would simply go into a package manager and they have an installed package that I highly recommend, which is just utterly fantastic. OpenVPN client export. If you don't have this installed, just go to available packages, install it. Uh, so let's walk through a sample VPN install real fast. And really there's only two tabs you need to concern yourself with here. We have the wizard and we have the client export. For the wizard, we just come right into here. What type of server it is. Local access means all of the authentication happens directly on this box. If we had an active directory, we could authenticate with LDAP and do it through LDAP. If we had just a radius authentication, another box, let's say a Ubiquity sometimes has radius servers for their security gateways, you could do radius. So pretty awesome. Uh, for this, we're gonna just do local user access, hit next. 
uh, certificate authority, you would add a new CA. Let's go ahead and add another one. And we'll call this CTT2. And most of this, I'm gonna keep exactly the same. So uh, lifetimes 10 years, doesn't need to be any longer this because guess what? This equipment's not gonna last 10 years. Uh, country code, US, Texas, Dallas, that's where I'm at. Organization, Chris Titus Tech. So that's it, we would just add new CA. So we'll go ahead and do that. With that, we'll hit next. And then we select the WAN interface. Uh, very important, sometimes it might default to LAN, you want it as WAN. So uh, usually this said WAN, I actually renamed mine AT&T, just, just for more clarity, uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, protocol UDP on IPv4 only. I don't write, really like doing it through V6 unless uh, there's some specific request for it. And uh, that's pretty much it, all this same. Uh, I use TLS authentication and generating the TLS key, have it all do that automatically. Uh, the DH parameters, I always use 2048. Encryption algorithm, 256, 256. Uh, on the Synology box, we were actually using 512. So let's go ahead and make 512. If you have any hardware crypto acceleration, you can enable it here, but I'm using just like an old $100 the cheap uh, China made box that is generic. So uh, it doesn't have any of that goodness on it. Um, the tunnel network, this is where the IP needs to be unique. That's 70.0, but I can just go ahead and make this something different. Let's go ahead and make it 90.0, uh, just as long as it's not my local network and it's not gonna be the network that I'm connecting to or, or connecting from. So obviously not very many people would have a 90.0 uh, local network, so it would be very safe. Obviously, never use like dot one nine two one six eight zero dot you know zero or one dot zero. That would be really really bad because so many networks have that. So always be unique with your tunnel. Uh, force all client generated through the tunnel. Typically uh, on OpenVPN when setting up through PFSense, I kind of like to leave this disabled because I don't want a lot of my users bogging down my network. If I redirect all my traffic through it. That means when that person goes out to the internet, when they go to download something, it first goes through the business and over to them. But if I just say don't, it'll just, they'll use wherever they're at. So this can be a double-edged sword. Uh, this is definitely not the most secure way if you leave this unchecked, but it's not gonna bog down your network. If your entire office is working from home right now, you don't want to needlessly tax that. They're already in a relatively secure location, so you probably wanna leave this unchecked. However, in most working businesses, and let's say you have a lot of people traveling to hotels and connecting through VPNs there, that is one method where you'd probably want them to redirect all the way through it. So it depends on your business. If you have everyone working from home, this is gonna really tax your internet connection. You have to have a lot of good bandwidth at your business to redirect everyone in your office through it. But if you have only like a handful of people and you have a good internet connection, uh, obviously you'd wanna redirect everything through the office because that would secure the endpoint that's connecting and then also makes the network a little bit more secure as well. So uh, a very good thing to do. Uh, concurrent connections, five, that's fine as this is just for my home here. And uh, dynamic IP goes ahead and says, hey, uh, allow connected clients to retain their connections even if their IP changes. For security purposes, you might disable this, but if they're constantly flopping back and forth between like a cellular connection and a Wi-Fi connection, um, this can help them. So it depends on your user. Uh, I usually leave this enabled. It just depends on what's going on. So for me, uh, I would probably go ahead and disable that because I don't usually connect through my cell phone and uh, from a place that would constantly be flopping uh, my IP. As far as the DNS servers, typically these would be, you can do external ones like I did uh, Cloudflare and Google DNS right here. But if you wanted to do, let's say a DNS server locally, if you're connecting to a business, you probably put your DNS servers that are maybe your domain controllers so they can properly resolve um, certain addresses in your your business so let's say i needed to connect to server one at, at my business uh, obviously if the dns server is 1.1.1 that's an external one that's not going to be able to resolve server one if i try and ping server one on this connection but if this dns was something local let's say i had a dns server at 
69.10. This right here, if this was a DNS server and it identify those server names, uh, this would be a good thing to do. Uh, however, if you are going to do this, make sure you're redirecting all the traffic through it as uh, that, that type of interface, I would recommend that. So with that, that's DNS in a nutshell. Everything else, leave blank and onto the next screen. So it actually told me at the end here was the local port was in use because I do have another VPN server currently up. So I'll actually change this to 1195 just so it doesn't, uh, doesn't mess with it and we'll change the description as I do have a VPN server already set up. And with that, I think everything's pretty much set. Firewall rule, open VPN rule. It auto makes the firewall rules for you. It auto makes the VPN rules for you. Very powerful. We'll go ahead and hit next and finish. And that's the entire setup of the server on PFSense. Really powerful, really easy. Uh, obviously, I don't need this instance. I'm going to go ahead and delete it as I just set this up. I just kind of want to walk you through what that would be like. And the cool thing about this instance is, one, if you have multiple VPN servers like I have here, you can select it. And you can just go ahead and export the inline client file. So if you're setting up another server and doing like site to site, you can just grab this client file right here. That's fantastic. If you were just connecting a bunch of Windows machines, they make an executable installer that just installs everything for you. You go like next, 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 and then connect. <laughs> very, very easy. And then uh, the thing I like most about OpenVPN as well is it's you know pretty much agnostic depending on whatever operating system. I have a lot of Mac OS users that uh, just need VPN access and a lot of those other methods that can be kind of a pain to set up to where uh, this, you just download this bundle and away you go. Or you could just go ahead and import an inline config file, which is great. So let's go ahead and run one of these just so you can see the installation process and what that looks like. All right, so here is this desktop Windows 10. Uh, absolutely fantastic because uh, this is as far away as I can get. I'm remoted into a different computer on a whole different network running a Windows VM and uh, yeah. You can't get further away from this. So let's see how easy it is to connect to this VPN now that it's set up. So we'll go ahead and say yes. We'll go install. It'll run through this install process. Just next, next, agree. Don't need to change anything. Next, uncheck README. Finish and close. And from here, we can just simply launch our open VPN GUI. It'll usually hide in the tray. You'll see this little computer with a lock. Just right click that, hit connect. It'll say, hey, authenticate. We'll type in our user and then our password. And then we can actually do save password and then we're good to go. So we'll just go ahead and hit okay. It'll connect. All right, and there we go. I went ahead and just pulled up an old uh, browser after connecting to the VPN to see if I could hit my Synology box because Synology box doesn't even exist over on this network. And as you see, we can access everything in my home network just by establishing this VPN. It is that simple. On Linux, if you want to walk through guide, by all means, watch that other video in the description as that'll help you out. But with all that said, let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. And as always, thank you to all my patrons. Without you, I couldn't make videos like this one.